Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's episode, I meet an author who uh, is in Illinois. Actually, they're in Johnsburg, Illinois. There's a funny thing that I mentioned because I'm a huge Tom Waits fan, and she's like, nobody's heard of this town. And I'm like, there's a song written about your town. <laughs> so, that, And they had no idea. So that was kind of funny. Anyway, I feel like I spoiled it now, but it'll still be there. You'll enjoy it. You will just won't be as surprised. Uh, anyway, we talk about uh, how this author actually started writing over the pandemic, like a lot of us taking up some sort of hobby or not hobby, but taking up a creative passion and putting it out there. And they actually got signed to a publishing company and started putting out books. And it's a great story. The person already was a writer, but they're a a technical writer, a promotional writer, a person who writes for websites and marketing and things like that. And we talk about how that transfers over into readability for a romance author. And we also talk about the process of getting the word out there and just uh, a lot of a lot of things that a lot of us artists and creators go through trying to do your own work and make it a full-time thing. So it's a fun conversation and here it is starting right now. My name is Julina Vickis and I am a contemporary romance author. Now, what does contemporary mean? Like, are there different versions? I know there's a romantic period, which I never understood because it's actually very dark, but that, that part always literary, uh, literary wise confused me. Why can't I say literary? Oh, no. I mean, that's a total. But totally, what is, yeah, yeah, what is it? <laughs> it's a fair question. Contemporary just alludes to the fact that what you're writing in is more or less present day. And when oh. I say present day, it's really like, call it like 1990 up to okay. like current, right? Up till today. So anything that's set before that would be in a different historical time period. What so about what about ones when they have to go back to like I've seen romantic comedies where people either go back in time or someone from the past comes forward and they fall. What would that be the same thing? I'm getting into a real like back to the future thing here. I know you're getting into a real deep conversation very quickly. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. I guess I would call that like a time travel type romance. It's a very common trope that I think you would find in romantic fiction. So okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. and it would still be romantic. I love it when. Uh, I mean, it's it makes sense when you have to add other genres on top of it. So it's slash. So that being a time travel slash contemporary comedy <laughs> slash period piece. Right. I don't know. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so where are you located right now? Where do you live? Yeah, I live in central Illinois. I'm about two hours south of Chicago. OK. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you've is, is that where you've always lived? Well, not my entire life. Um, I was born and raised in the Chicago, like Chicagoland suburbs. I don't know okay. if anybody out there would ever know, but Johnsburg, Illinois is my hometown. Okay. And then I moved to central Illinois to actually go to college. I went to Illinois State University and I just never left. I actually work there today now. Okay. I actually know Johnsburg, Illinois because of a Tom Waits song. What? <laughs> there's, there's a Tom Waits song called Johnsburg, Illinois. And it, yeah, it's a very short, it's actually a romantic piece. Uh, it's a short uh, song that he wrote about his wife. And the last line is she, uh, she was born outside McHenry in Johnsburg, Illinois. Oh, that's wild. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before. It's actually a very sweet that's song it. and it's like maybe a minute long. Yeah. It's called Johnsburg, Illinois. Well, I there know what go. I'm going to do when you and I hang up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you'll like it. I don't know, because it is it is a very sweet song. It's from, I want to say it's from the mid 80s. But huh. uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I know a lot about Tom Waits. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, now speaking of fans, now you write contemporary, uh, contemporary romance. Mm -hmm. Why do you write contemporary romance? I, I'm always, my... I'm always uh, curious why people write romance. I mean, I not curious. I'm always interested to know uh, why they chose that path. I mean, I know it's a popular genre, but what, what yeah. got you started? Oh, no, I think it's a really fair question. I, I think personally, when I'm going to sit down and read a book yeah. or write a book, I want to do something that is just so out of my norm. It's away from my typical day to day. It's away from all the heaviness of the world and the things that we kind of trudge through on a day to day basis. And so it's just a place to kind of escape. And just okay. have a little bit of fun. Just enjoy something that's not going to be a learning experience. It's not meant for anything more than just, you know, a little time away to kind of re-energize and recharge. So, I mean, a sweet and simple love story 
that's totally what I'm going to pick up every single time. Right. See, I would have I would have gone for in that same thought. I would have gone for sci-fi, even though I'm not really a huge sci-fi guy. I like making up things yeah. where I don't have to prove it. Uh, <laughs> Fair point, though. <laughs> but but then you said uh, you don't have to learn something. I feel like with sci-fi, you always have to learn a moral. Yeah, or be you taught a lesson, something. whether it be a yeah, whether it be tragic or not. Yeah, there's always a purpose behind it, or you yeah. have to learn more about like the world building kind of you know environment. Like oh, yeah, I also love point. reading like fantasy. Like I am a huge like the Lord of the Rings like crazy nerd. Mm -hmm. But when you pick up a book like that, like it's an engaging, your mind has to be really actively present to absorb that lore. And yeah. so when you think of like a, a silly, sweet romance, like you don't have to think too difficult, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of there and it's like a surface <laughs> level story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get that. <laughs> and then you said, uh, so you were saying like a, a short, quick thing now, like how do you write shorter novels? Do you write regular length novels? Like, I guess how, how, how big are the books you write? Yeah, I would say mine are pretty standard for the industry. I try to shoot for about 75,000 words for okay. each novel. Um, anything shorter than about like 60,000 is considered a novella. Okay. I've never written one of those just because I think I need more space to tell my story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've only recently heard about the phrase novella. And mm -hmm. I mean, from the name, I can assume what it is, but I guess I've never really considered the difference between a novel and a novella. I, I almost consider a, no, a novella like an essay type size, which kind of right. You know, it's just yeah, a, maybe. a shorter span, you know, and if you're really trying to like dive a little deeper and tell a significant story where you feel good at the end of it, like you just need a, a few more words to make that character depth happen. So okay, some people are really good at it. I've never tried. <laughs> and now you said you've been writing for how many years? I've been writing creatively, I would say, for only about two years at this point. Really? Um, but prior to that, I mean, I have a career in writing. It's just more in like strategic writing. So I write for like marketing, public relations, journalism. So I've always kind of had my hand in being a writer, but I just kind of flipped gears and just branched out and tried something new, kind of right when the pandemic started. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And I, I would say probably a lot of people took that jump, but I'm going to ask you a little bit about the writing for strategic marketing. Now, explain to me that, that when you say you write for that, are you doing white papers? Are you writing articles? Are you doing both? I mean, what what is your process? Or I mean, what do you do? I'm, I'm curious to hear about yeah. writing in that realm. Absolutely. Um, so what I do primarily is I teach in the School of Communication at Illinois State University. Okay. And there's a handful of writing focused courses that I instruct. So I do everything from like writing for public relations. I do editorial and feature writing, magazine production. So it's a different type of writing, but I do it mostly to obviously teach my students how to do it well. Okay. And a lot of questions are coming. I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. So I am, I do know a lot about marketing, mm -hmm. but I hate writing. Right. So I'm curious, I, but I, I, I know of the right. So when you're saying you write all those different things, are you talking about, uh, you're actively publishing for these, like do you get hired to do it or you're writing examples of how to do it? So I think I'm in a, a more unique position in uh -huh. my role as a faculty member in the school in the fact that I not only teach the courses, but I actually am kind of the marketing person for the school that I work for. Okay. So I get to write and publish feature stories weekly, I yeah. do the social media content and creation for the school. And it's mostly active in the terms of like recruiting new students, working with prospective students, making sure that our students are successful and happy in what they do. Okay. So I kind of serve this weird dual role where I do it for the school, but then I also teach the students in the school how to do it well. Yeah, that's handy. Yeah. <laughs> you, get it to, works well. you get to use it by example. And then also, do you get to test out different things such as uh, like the importance of the headlines and the bullet points and things that are like you're writing for SEO basically too, correct? You do. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking to recruit a prospective student, I mean, you're hoping that they're going to come across your landing page. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and also making sure that they... The, First, it's scrollable. And then second, like how to draw them in to actually go, okay, I scrolled through to see if this is even interesting. And oh, yeah. then when they do, they have to actually get value and go, okay, I am going to read this part instead of yeah. going away. So you have to learn how to keep them. Kind of like how people who make videos have to learn yeah. why people drop off because the video got boring, oh, which I'm sure is probably another TikTok. thing you have to talk about because that's like <laughs> marketing all over the place. 
It is very transferable, but you're absolutely right. I think about that for, you know, TikTok, you know, kind of content too. It's like, if you're scrolling through, just looking at your feed, I mean, if you don't like what you see, it's gone. <laughs> right, like exactly. One second. Yeah, you can't go <laughs> so. back and find it. <laughs> mm-mm, mm-mm, no, <laughs> Which is also the hook. same thing for marketing. Like sometimes it pops up on, uh, like say you have a news feed or if it does pop up on Facebook. Although on Facebook, if they're, if they're advertising it, it'll show up for a good week in your feed. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so a lot of that, and this is why I asked that question about the uh, the readability and the staying with it sort of thing and testing that out. Has some of that transferred over to how you write uh, the romance novels? Because Absolutely. You know, yeah. So it's one of those things where you want to keep them reading. And like, what have you learned transferring that knowledge to the romance novel because i'm sure it's probably hard to turn off the oh this is where it's gonna droop a little i couldn't think of a better word than droop (laughs) yeah no i totally (laughs) understand uh yeah you're absolutely right i think there's there's quite a bit of overlap but the primary example i think that's coming to my head first is when you're writing you know like an editorial or like a feature piece right you need to hook your reader in from that very first line so if that first line doesn't quite do it you've lost your reader, right? They're not going to continue on and spend the time on however many pages you have coming. And I would say that that kind of translates when you're writing a romance novel, but it's kind of backwards. It's not the first line that's going to hook you in. It's the last line of the chapter that's going to keep you going. So what I work to do, right, is so your reader doesn't fall into that little slump as they're reading you want to make sure that last line of any chapter is is fire, right? So the reader is mm-hmm. going, oh, one more chapter, you know, before I go to bed. So it's kind of the hook, but it's in reverse than what you okay. would traditionally do for journalism. Okay. And th- <laughs> then when you started writing these books, you said you did it around the pandemic. What made mm-hmm. you finally go, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna write this book. <laughs> is it something you've yeah. been thinking about for a long time or how, how did that get started? Yeah, it's kind of a story, actually. Um So the pandemic, when that whole thing started, my job went completely remote, just like everybody else in the world, right? Um, And so it was kind of this quick transition of trying to figure out how to instruct courses and advise and meet, you know, new students on Zoom, right, as my primary platform. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that was hard, right? Figured it out, kind of moved along. But then here in the state of Illinois, our governor shut down daycare. (laughs) And so at the time... Uh My children were three, two, and one. So it was one of those moments of how in the world am I supposed to like (laughs) teach classes right on this brand new platform that I've never experienced and still give my students a meaningful time. But then I had these three kids, right, that were like right next to me the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it was just this flat out, just impossible time period. And I got so stressed and so overwhelmed that I needed some kind of outlet something that was for me and wasn't for everyone else in my world. And I thought about, you know, what can I do to just make myself feel a little bit better? And I thought, well, you know, I'm a storyteller by nature. I'm a writer. What can I do that's going to make me, you know, feel a little bit better about kind of the situation I'm in? And when I really thought about it, my head went back to this really ridiculous script that I had written in graduate school like 10 years ago. It's a script for a feature length film. And I just happened to kind of have that just in the back of my mind for, I mean, honestly, a decade. And when I thought about, well, I'm going to do storytelling. What if I just try to write a book? And I just went straight back to that script that I had already started years ago. And I just- Why didn't you finish that script? I'm curious. Well, I finished it. But I mean, I was like this, I don't know, 22-year-old kid who thought I knew how to write well. And I- Right. Clearly did, and you right? went straight to my, a movie script. Hands, right? <laughs> so I went back to this movie script, right? Okay. And, you know, it was a good story, but it wasn't meant for a script per se. And I just tweaked it and used it as a classic romance novel. Okay. And did you have dreams of working in the movies? I did. I did. Okay. Um, when I was younger, I had my heart set on going to film school. I was going to be this fabulous director. And that, you know, didn't quite pan out for me. <laughs> right. Okay. The love is still there for it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, had you had you ever directed anything? No. <laughs> no? You haven't made any films? or Okay. You start out with the script and like that's where. Yep. I could, you know, that happens I think to a lot of us too, like getting interested in something and then starting to do it. And that kind of goes, okay, I did that for a while and I'm going to, maybe I'll pick it up again later or, you know. Yeah. 
I, kind I of cycle of around like to that. different things at different time. <laughs> yeah, I get that. And it did. You actually just, you were like, oh, wait, I can do this. Yep. Plus being stuck, you're like, I can write this and put it out. So yep. how did you, after you wrote this book, first of all, is, is, you've written a couple of books. Yeah. Um, I just finished my fourth one just two days ago, actually. Do they all involve the same characters? The, so far, yes, okay. they do. Because um, I noticed there was a there was a very similar uh, cast of characters on the book covers. So I was yes. curious if it was just maybe that's the way all guys look to me now, or if it was the <laughs> same one, if you were implying that there were the same characters. No. Um, so I think what's it's pretty common, I think, for the industry. But the first three that I wrote, it's a trilogy, and okay. it has six main characters. But... Each book focuses on a different pair of those six characters. So if they started as a primary character, they become secondary in the other two novels. So you see the same people and you see the same storyline like progressing, but each person gets their time in the spotlight. Okay. And Mm -hmm. now you wrote these books, or not these books, but the first book that you wrote. After you wrote it, what was your process for going, okay, I wrote it, and not letting it just be, this was my screenplay, and you know, it's I'm I'm done with it, maybe I'll pick it up later. How did you go from writing it to, okay, now I'm going to put it out there? How did you know what to do with it? (laughs) Um, A lot of hours researching, (laughs) I will say that. Um, I'm not quite sure what made me want to try to get it published. But as I started learning and building confidence in the story that I was telling, something in me just said, well, you know, it doesn't just have to be this file that sits on my computer for nobody else to read. Right. If I like it and I'm finding joy in it, maybe there's another reader in the world who would find the same enjoyment. And so researching different options of like path to publication, I thought I would try the traditional route and query for an agent or a publisher. And to be honest, I think I just got just really lucky (laughs) um, and found somebody very quickly. Oh, you did? I did. Yeah. I worked with Inkspell Publishing and she has just been, I mean, just phenomenal. Like she took a chance on this, you know, random new girl who just showed up in her inbox one day, but uh it's been an incredible experience. I'm so grateful to her. Okay. And what, so you, uh, I guess you got signed, I guess you would call it, is that, that would be the term, right? You got signed to Inkspell? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It just seems weird to say that about a book, you know, yeah. anyway, never mind. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting hung up on terminology. So you're with Inkspell. There you go. You're with Inkspell. That's I'm what I meant them. to say. Um, and what, what did that do? What was the process once they, uh, you sent them the, the manuscript that you had and yeah. they read it and said, sure. And then now what, what happens when, when, yeah. the, you know, it's like when I, when I find out a musician gets signed to a label and it's like, and now what's going to happen, you know? So mm-hmm. what happens after you did this? Well, what happens after that is you sit around and kind of wait for about a year. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's one of the most like heartbreaking parts, right? It's like you have such momentum and yeah. excitement and then you sign a contract for a publication. They're like, and your publishing date is 18 months out. And okay. you're like, oh, 18 months, huh? I guess I guess that is what it is, right? But they mm-hmm. work on a very specific publishing schedule, and they only publish one book per month to focus their time and energy in the right places and help right. each author along. So I can respect that, right? It's not just about me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it took about 18 months from the day I signed that contract to the day it actually was released to the public. Um, but a few months beforehand, you get partnered with an editor, and you do several rounds of professional editing. Um, you work with a designer. They put the cover together for you. And then you work specifically with um, the publishing specialist. And they get it available on multiple different platforms for a presale. So there's a handful of things that go into it. You start maybe like five or six months before the actual publication date to get things finalized. Right. Which would be another reason why delaying it as well is because there's stuff involved in the making of it. And this was going to be, I, I'm assuming hard book and, or not hard book, but uh, a, a book and ebook is what I meant to say. So yes. it was both of those. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And, um, mm-hmm. and it went into stores. Yeah, it is. It's in stores. <laughs> okay. That's kind of exciting. That's neat. It is. <laughs> it's a very okay. cool, uh, like fulfilling experience to see like what was once just this like block of words on your computer to actually like holding a physical copy of your book and be like, look, people can buy this now. <laughs> yeah. Now, if people were able to actually go out during this time period, would you have toured with the book or would there, or have you since then now that people yeah. can go out? Yeah, no, really good question. I think it was still in one of those just like weird 
time periods where it was like the pandemic was still a thing, but not quite as much of a thing as we were in you know previous years. Um, so I did a lot of very local efforts here in my hometown, but I haven't really broadened out to do anything more at this point. I've been pretty focused on just making sure that these are successful first before I try to do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, would have been nice. A lot of virtual opportunities, book mm-hmm. blogs, promotional tours, stuff like that. Yeah. And do they send you, uh, yeah, you would write articles, I would assume, or you have something that you would send out to blogs or whatever. Would they just, mm-hmm. would Inkspell go, we found this place or this person and send them this information type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's It's been a really nice, I would say, partnership too, in the fact mm-hmm. that they will certainly do some of that marketing outreach for me. But a lot of it is up to me as an That's author as nice. well to figure out the marketing strategy and promotional you know, ideas to just get it into the hands of readers. Yeah. And it's, it's gotta be hard to sit still and, you know, not go, Hey, and it's good that they let you do that too. Cause some people yeah. might be like, no, you're not allowed to do this. Only do who we talk to. Oh, um, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's nice that they give you that freedom. I like that. I completely agree. There's, there's been lots of moments where I'm like, here's an idea that I want to try. What do you think? And it's always been a sure, go for it. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> as long I, as I, I get the permission first. Right. <laughs> right. And it's just, it's fascinating that uh, I'm so used to people starting out with the self publishing and then finding people and you just jumped right in. So that's really nice. <laughs> like, like I said, that. I really got lucky. <laughs> I didn't know any better and I was totally brand new. I'm like, I'll oh, just try it and see what happens. And I don't know if it was timing or what, but uh, things worked out really well. So okay. <laughs> can't complain. <laughs> and do they ask you to write more books or did you inform them that you had more books? You were Like, how did you come up with the books that followed? Yeah. Um, so as I was, I guess, kind of sitting around waiting to hear back from like a publisher or an agent, mm-hmm. the best advice I had ever received was don't stop writing. And so when I finished the first book and was just kind of in that holding period of who's going to work with me, Mm -hmm. I just kept going. And so even though when I started writing, I didn't intend for it to be a three book trilogy, just kind of spiraled into one. So I just kept going. And then when I signed that first one, that first contract, it was kind of like, oh, wait, and... There's two right. more coming. <laughs> There's two more. Okay. She was like, great. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> so, Yeah. And I guess I, I, I wondered too, like uh, when they sign you for that, do they expect you to write more books or are they just like, we're signing you for this one book and that's, we, we don't want another one or yeah. I guess that would be weird. Um, I, I just don't know how that process works. I, I, I mean, I've never been published, so I don't know. <laughs> and I can't speak, I guess super well on it, but I can think back in terms of like the contract language that I looked at. And there's a clause in there that's about like the right of first refusal. So if Hmm. like you continue on and use like overlapping characters or like location or plot, if anything is tied back to your original works that were signed with them, they get the right of first refusal to that book. So they could read it and go, no, this one is way worse than the first one that you submitted. You go and do what you want with it. (laughs) Or if they like it, right, then they'll continue to sign you for it. So I think it's just kind of like your your preference of if you're going to continue the story or if you want to start fresh, you know, you have that that kind of like leeway to decide which way you want to go. Okay, And uh, the way that you just responded to that, uh, this is way worse. Uh, thing made me think of another question. So (laughs) had you worked with an editor before? (laughs) Because that's a person going, do this, don't do that. Or this doesn't work. Or what's this? So what's that? Had you done that before? You know, it's it's very weird because I've served in like an editing capacity before. So I was familiar with kind of what that would look like. But it was so weird to be on the opposite side of things. So you just get so like emotionally attached to like your story and your character And when somebody else who's like this impartial third person who just like steps in and inserts their opinion, you're like, I don't know about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, again, I was really fortunate and I just matched really well with the couple editors that I worked with previously. And, you know, it's still your work. It's still your story. And so you have complete freedom to say, I'm just going to go ahead and veto that idea and Mm -hmm. we're going to do this. And here's why, you know, as long as you have a rationale for it everybody's really flexible and just wants to see your vision come to light. Okay. So I found I, it pretty fulfilling, pretty easy, but I'm sure there's so many people who just luck out like this, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, I'm, I'm heard that it's supposed to be bad, but it turned out that it was great. For me. 
right? <laughs> so now that all this had happened, what are some of the things you learned from starting out just putting – since going, I'm going to read – or I'm going to write the story – getting signed, putting it out there, actually publishing it. What are some things you learned along the way? What are some opportunities that you, you know, uh, because of this that you realized? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest one is when you sit down and you say, I'm going to write a book. That's just one tiny piece of the entire process. Mm -hmm. as silly as that sounds, right? Writing is just the first step. It's what comes after that I had absolutely no clue. Because you're expected as an author to not only write your stories, but you're expected to sell them as well. Mm -hmm. So all of the marketing, building your own website, having your own social media presence that's active and engaging daily. Um, you have to have this like knowledge, like strategic knowledge, right? To be able to sell your books and find the ideal readers. Now, you know, I came from a little bit of that background, having worked right. in public relations. So it's like, it wasn't completely foreign to me, but I would never, I had never done it before. So one thing that just really blindsided me was, oh, I'm not just the writer of this story. I am the seller of this story too. Mm -hmm. So you have to be like the face of your story and, you know, appear on podcasts, right? To find <laughs> other readers, right? right? Or be on blogs or get yourself on TikTok, right? Like there's all these things that come with it that nobody really tells you in the beginning. <laughs> so that yeah. was a big lesson to me. Yeah. And I've noticed, uh, or I, I did notice on your website and on your Facebook page that you do share tips. You, you write like I, when you said you have that, uh, the communications background and that you're working in that, it's very clear because you, you do share a lot of tips and put in things. And I also agree that being able to do that for other products, for other people, for other things, mm -hmm is fine. But then when yeah. it's your turn, it's just like, I can't say this stuff about myself. You know, that, that's a tough one. Like, it's hard. It just sounds like boasting or like, I know everything. Uh, and it's like, no, no, I'm just sharing and getting, you know, like I got to a certain point and I'm trying to tell people and share. And exactly. yeah. it's super weird. And, you know, by nature, I'm this like ridiculous introvert, right? So it's like, I don't get joy from being around large groups of people all the time. <laughs> and so when all of a sudden you have to be like the star of the show, it feels super weird to just constantly throw information out into the world about you and what you're doing and your success. Like it, yeah. it feels very uncomfortable. Um, I don't think I'll ever feel comfortable with that process, but if you want to sell your book, that's what's required. Yeah. And actually, here's something that every creator could uh, benefit from knowing more about. And I always feel like maybe writers have an easier time doing this. But writing a bio, that's one of the hardest things in that vein that I've ever had to do. One, because I always feel like I'm, I'll am i write it about myself. And then it, when I'm writing it in the first person, it sounds like boasting. And exactly. two, if I write it in a third person, it's kind of like, why are you referring? Why are you saying your name in this bio? So do you have any tips writing for writing it. a bio? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you have to um, you have to use non-descriptive words, right? So you can't just say like, I am, you know, the recipient of X, Y, and Z words, right? So uh -huh. you have to like tone it down and just say award winning. Right. You're not so you're not boasting okay. to the specifics. Right. But still alluding to the success. So in the accomplishments, just start with what it is you're talking about rather than exactly this yeah. person or I, Tom Ray, the fan. No, never mind. I was going to I was going to joke and like write say a bunch of flowery words, but it's like, nah. um, even then, even while I was making a joke, I'm like, that just right. sounds silly. I'm not going to say that. Exactly. It's the <laughs> truth, though. It's a really hard piece to write because you still want to sound engaging enough for a reader to go, oh, tell me more about this person. Right. But yeah. you also don't want to throw out all of these ridiculous facts that just turn people off immediately. So okay. it's like smooth language that alludes to like what you're best known for, maybe. Okay. Mm hmm. Now, uh, I want to go back to the book a little bit too. You had mentioned there are a bunch of characters. And I guess I'm curious, uh, how do you come up with the characters that you use? Why, why do they specifically exist? You know, it's, it's one thing. I can write a story and start off with two people and go, it does this. But then it's like they have to interact with people. Or who are these other? So, so uh, I guess I'm asking about character creation. What, uh, yeah. how, how do you go about that? Well, I think, I think the biggest and I'll call it a secret, maybe, because maybe some people genuinely just don't know. Uh -huh. But when you create a character, you have to start with their internal flaw. 
what's something about them, right, that they struggle with. They have a specific goal in mind, but it is completely internal and specific to that person. So it's kind of what they're going to overcome throughout the journey. But you can't tell a story just about internal conflict, right? You can't just be in a character's head for, you know, 400 pages. Mm -hmm. There has to then be external conflict. What's happening in the world around them and how are other people impacting their, you know, moral arc, essentially. So when I start with creating a character, I think about what's their problem first? What's going to be their deal? What are they up against? What are they trying to overcome? And then the external conflict comes into the story. So I guess if I had like a piece of advice about character creation, mm-hmm. you start with their flaw. You start with what they want to overcome. Okay. And that helps build your arc as you're writing the story. So instead of talking about a background, you talk about uh, a possible thing that they're dealing with right now and introduce that way. Oh, I guess that's, yeah. yeah, that's kind of interesting. I get that. Absolutely. Well, it's more, it's more humanizing. Yeah. It's more relatable. We all have flaws. We all have things we're working to overcome. So if you can get a reader to latch on to like at the core, what it is this character is trying to do, that's an easy way for them to keep turning pages. You know, external conflict is great, right? And it'll keep your heart pumping and you're going to kind of want to continue. But -hmm. ultimately the satisfaction comes when the character actually overcomes whatever it is they were struggling with on the first page. Okay. More fulfilling. I get that. All right. Sorry. My, my mind's, uh, spinning out because I, I totally feel like this can apply to, I'm working on a few uh, uh, comics, uh, oh. different comics than what I normally do. And I just have these characters and one it's kind of okay. But then as it goes along, I'm just like, what, what am I doing this one for? And then another one where I'm just like, Oh, this one's kind of more of a nonsense. And, and I'm <laughs> going through it. I like that one because it's more freeing because instead of me going like, Hey, what's this big story going to be? And how's it yeah. going to interject? It's very short in kind of what you're talking about, but in nonsense, SpongeBob kind of way, we're like, <laughs> Hey, I got this thing. And then all of a sudden it's like, but I don't know. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like the conflict and resolute resolution that happens is dumb thing resolved by even dumber thing. And that's it, you know, like, cause I've otherwise all I feel like I'm doing is I'm writing a gag and it's like yeah. one, two, did it, did it, did it, you know? And it's like, and I don't like those. Um, anyway, I don't know if any of that made any sense, but what you were saying made me think about something I'm think working on as a creator. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that was me thinking out loud. Enjoy everybody. I love it. See, there's so much <laughs> ways you can transfer the knowledge. <laughs> exactly. And then uh, now you, have a website that you post to all the time and you already have a publishing company that gets the word out for you, but you said you also do your own promotion. Now, uh, I guess, how do you promote yourself? Uh, do you manage your website? Does someone do it for you? And do you do any marketing? Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a one woman show at this point. Okay. Um, you know, my fir- this first book of mine published just last August. So it's just been kind of this like whirlwind learn as I go literally every single day. So right now it's really, it is just me. Um, I do the website stuff, which you can tell it's very amateur. No, no, it's (laughs) Um, not. Actually, it's very nice. I was, I was very impressed. You got a WordPress site going and yeah, you you, you got a lot of posts to it. It's very good. Trying my hardest, right? (laughs) Um, Hopefully one day I can make it better, but it was a good place to start. Uh, So yeah. So right now in terms of like promotion and stuff, I spend a lot of time on social media It's a large part of what I do for like my daytime job. And so active on all the major platforms, try to post daily and engage with um, potential readers, current readers, right? Just to keep the momentum up. Um, I also have a newsletter. I send one out to my readers at least once a month. I try not to spam everyone. Um, But again, it's a good way to keep engaged and just stay at the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, Those have been the most successful things for me so far. I've also had a blog for, I guess, maybe a year and a half or so at this point. Yeah. And I strategically try to use that as more of a a learning tool. So if people find me because I have, you know, information to share or tips or advice, then if they like what I have to say, they might be interested in reading as well. So just kind of a more like roundabout way to capture different readers just to try to find a different market. So just a couple of things that I try to do. In between everything else. Right, exactly. Yeah, it was, wasn't a lot. No. Right. <laughs> and with the newsletter, what what kind of things do you do with the newsletter? Um, is, do you do you 
put out excerpts of the book? Do you have uh, side stories that you write about? I'm curious what authors do with their newsletters. Yeah, I think it's really wide open. Um, I've seen so many authors take it in so many different directions. I try to make it as uh, pretty short and sweet and to the point as I can. Nobody wants another email. We all know mm-hmm. that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of usually just a quick like summary, a recap of, okay, it's been a month since I talked to you. Here's what I'm working on. Here's some exciting news. This is what's coming up. Um, I also try to include just different links to different places that I've maybe appeared. So like in the future, I'll have a link to the podcast that you and I are doing, right? Works for just me. To reach out, <laughs> find some more viewers, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I do typically, I'll share like the first chapter of my upcoming book. So the ones that have not been published quite yet, readers can still access the first chapter, which Mm -hmm. is kind of a nice tool to be like, hey, did you like that first chapter? You might want to read the whole book when it comes out. Um, So just different things like that. Usually a link to my like most recent blogs. Um, If I have friends who are, you know, pushing out a new book, publishing, have something exciting, happy to share and swap ideas. Honestly, I think it's other authors that help just as much as your own promotion, because if you like similar genres or similar styles of writing, you know, you can share each other's work and benefit from that. Yeah. And one thing I've heard about authors uh, or authors have told me is that because uh, you mentioned TikTok and I get, you know, TikTok being a big platform, but authors are all like, oh, you got to search for what is it like? Uh, there's a hashtag on there for like book author or something. I forget what the yeah. hashtag is, but like, book talk. <laughs> there you go. Book talk. And <laughs> What are authors doing on there? I'm because I have not searched for it. I have a let's put it this way: I have TikTok installed. It sends me alerts constantly, and I've never used it. I actually haven't set up my account yet, but I have it installed. Uh, so good job, TikTok. But uh, what do the authors do on there? I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I, I think there's a number of different things, and it's it's wildly successful because it's something that you can by chance go viral, right? Okay. It's all about the views and the consistency on that platform. Yeah. But typically, if I'm scrolling through my feed and I'm finding other book talk related posts, um, it could be promotional tools. So lots of times I've used like <clears throat> um, Canva, and you'll pull like stock images or stock video, and you make kind of like a little book trailer, right? Something that's intended to hook your reader so they'll want to go and purchase your book. Um, There's lots of trends. There's lots of, you know, page flip videos with, again, just like an intriguing hook that's trying to snag your reader. I was picturing the page flip ones. I was wondering if that was a thing. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, so many page flips. Like, personally, I don't really get it. Like, this doesn't draw my attention with just flipping pages in a book. But if you have the right text overlay that hooks your reader in, it works. <laughs> it really right. does. So. Has anybody at least done one of those page flip animations uh, where you draw in like the top corner of it and you do like a little stick figure, like jumping around or something? I mean, that's the I first thing I thought of. I haven't seen that or tried it, but <laughs> <laughs> you never know what the next new idea is going to be. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the first one that came to mind. So any any authors out there, try that and let me see if that, that goes viral. And then I I'll go, damn it, help. I should have done that. <laughs> so... Little tip from you, and I could be talking complete nonsense because, like I said, I actually haven't. I've installed it, but haven't used it yet, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know so what's going fun. on there. No, it'll um, it'll drain your time. I will say that. I'm it's sure it will. Amazing. I think that's what I'm afraid of is that I'll just uh-huh. keep going through. Yep. Um, <laughs> right, and then so on top of this, not like this wasn't uh, you doing a lot already, but what would you say is the hardest part about kind of being a you know, an author, an an individual promoting yourself? Yeah. um, I think it's trying to learn how to balance my time effectively. You know, Mm -hmm. it's I have three young kids, I have a husband, I have a full-time job, you know, and so it's, there's lots of needs that, you know, take priority in my life. But there's also things that I really choose to do for myself personally and my own growth and fulfillment. And so it's finding the balance of how to make that work. And, you know, there'll be days where it's just dedicated to everybody else, right? Because those are my commitments and responsibilities in life. But then maybe the next day I find a little bit more time to sit down and play around with my manuscript. Um, but really, it's just, again, it's it's the balance of time and finding how to make everybody happy, including myself. Yeah. and yeah. But you do make time for yourself is what you're saying for, for things each day? I do. I really try to make an effort. Uh, my kids go to bed like 730 or 8 o'clock. And so from that window till about 10 o'clock or so, that's like me time (laughs) to sit down and really focus on what it is I want to accomplish. 
it doesn't happen every day, but oh, I really not. try to make a genuine effort, right, to continue and, you know, keep the momentum. Because it's like if you take a week off, that stuff just falls out of my head. I have no idea where I was, what I was talking about, where I was going. So it's like you have to maintain consistency. <laughs> Oh, wow. You're like a 1960s uh, amnesia storyline. It's just like, where was I? <clears throat> That's a trope. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. Yeah. Very common. <laughs> Those I'm familiar with. Tropes I, yeah. uh, tropes I know all about. Right. <laughs> um, now, uh, in the uh, coming up in the future, what sort of plans do you have or projects or things coming out or anything you'd like to share that's going to be coming up in the near future? Yeah, sure. Um, so the third book in the trilogy, it's called I'll Love You Tomorrow. That one releases on April 18th. Oh, so nice. coming up, <laughs> getting pretty close. Yeah. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, I just finished drafting well, my first draft of my fourth novel. And so I'm just waiting here on my little inbox to get a contract to have that one in the cycle for publication, too. So that one probably won't come out until at least 2024. But the faster you can do them, you know, yeah. they show up eventually. <laughs> so. Nice. I, I, I'm always amazed at how much writers can write, but it's what they do. I mean, it's kind of, it's to you, it's like a, the way that I draw a comic like every day. It's just yeah. like, well, that's just what I do. Me, but if I, I do. sit down right. to write something, it's just like, whew, I'm going to write a line and then I'm going to pace back and forth for a few minutes and go, was that a stupid line? How am I going to write the next line? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm always in awe of writers. Well, likewise, right? If I sat down to try and create a comic, I would stare at a piece of paper and go, I am really not talented. I have no idea what I'm doing. So, all right. <laughs> Again, then, we find what we're good at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, we, we all have our own hangups on the, on the thing that we wish we could do. So, writing is mine. <laughs> um, and then, if people wanted to check out your more of your stuff, where would you suggest they go? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm mildly proud, <laughs> right, of the website that I've built, but that's yeah. a good hub, a uh, centralized place to find all the information that you would care to know about me as an author. So it's just www.authorjulinavickis.com. Uh, and then I'm just probably just too ridiculous on social media, but you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn. Um, I'm pretty much out there all day, every day. <laughs> so nice. I love to hear from readers. I love to hear reviews. Just, you know, tell me what you think. And, you know, I'm always open to ideas and want to be able to serve readers best. So I would love a follow. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. It was great oh, meeting thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate the conversation. 